captains, shipbuilding, shipping, trade routes, marine artists, shipwrecks, underwater archaeology, and pirates. We'll cover them all. What kind of maritime history does Pemberton have? What time, type, kind of maritime history does Pemberton deserve? That's how Now, Pemberton is surrounded by water and waterways, uh, the Pacific Ocean, the Harrison Lake and Fraser system, the uh, Littlewood Lake and its uh, tributaries, and Seton and, and Anderson Lake, of course. And these are stories going to be taking a tour around themes and, uh, and uh, puzzles and so on for each of these bodies of water. Of course, any maritime history in our part of the world starts with the Cedar Dugout Canoe. And I'm not sure, this is a, from a few years ago I took this picture here at the Pembroke Museum. But uh, there is a, a wonderful work been done on the Cedar Dugout Canoe in collaboration with the Little Watt folks. And uh, books produced and Charlie Mack and film and so on. Uh, this is from Squamish. It's also the case that visitors from way back were captivated by the Cedar Dugout Canoe. This is the first tourist to visit Squamish. Hopped off the train in Vancouver as soon as he could get out here and went up to Squamish and just was enthralled with Cedar Dugout Canoes. Emily Carr, another artist who visited Pemberton, uh, captivated by Cedar Dugout Canoes for her whole career. A marine artists in our part of the world what they did about Cedar Dug Oak Canoes is very interesting. Something interesting about Emily Carr, as an artist who visited here, is that she didn't like the water very much. She didn't like the Little River. She thought it was kind of spooky and uh, dangerous, perhaps. And uh, when she was up in Lillooet, she actually removed the Fraser River from her painting. <laughs> as you can see, comparing to the photograph below. We have no sketch or painting Emily Carr did in the Pemberton Valley where there's any water course shown at all, whether a lake or a river. Now, the First Nations people on the BC coast have also been captivated and enthralled by our European steam technology, first of all. This is the beaver. And uh, from uh, Haida Gwaii, uh, a so Haida artist in the 19th century carved a replica of the Beaver, a steam vessel owned by the Hudson's Bay Company that's been on this coast or was on the coast from mid 19th century. And from this valley, I have seen in private collections of uh, basketry uh, local artists going way back who are depicting steam vessels, those that plied the waters of Howe Sound. That's how they got to Vancouver, like everyone else and depicting these in basketry and fiber arts. Now, I will not be delving into so much the legends and the uh, myths regarding the canoe and uh, the work that has been done by those people working with inter uh, informants from the Lilwat uh, Nation, like the late Charlie Mack, uh, but these, uh, this is a presentation here at the Pemberton Museum some time ago in a recently published book and I went into that and I just got lost in what it has to relate about the place of the canoe in local legend and myth and uh, it is utterly fascinating. I will, however, show here on How Sound that there is a related uh, rock art uh, related to the Little Walk people and it is this wolf here that is depicted in the local style, not the coastal style, but the interior Salish style of, of, uh, of uh, pictographs. And it's at Furry Creek, next to a coastal site. So this is just one aspect of, of much uh, evidence and uh, story of the travel corridor that the local people used and is, of course, is a waterway as well. So uh, this is uh, what it depicts. This is, in fact, a local pic or, uh, rock art uh, or style of art from this area found on the side of uh, rock wall in House Howe, near Free Creek. This is more of a coastal image. And this has been well researched and increasing research is being done into this. So we live in a trade and travel corridor from time immemorial and a waterway, it's, it's a part then of our maritime history. About uh, back in the 1930s, when people like uh, Vancouver Museum and archivist uh, um, 
activist, uh, a, a, we, we might call him Major Matthews, uh, became friends with certain informants of the Squamish Nation, and uh, they started to work on place names. And one of these place names is just around the corner from Watts Point in Northern House Sound, Loch Loch House, and according to August Jack, there were Indian people from Pemberton sitting there that were turned into stones. <laughs> the legend is that the three rocks sitting on the beach at Loch Loch House were three Indian persons from Pemberton waiting to get a ride in the canoe to Squanch. So they've been down with big smoke already, they're on the way back. Castellano says they did not know if anybody was passing in a canoe, so they were just waiting in the hope that someone would come along and take them to Squanch. And they're still there. Now, I've been looking for this site, and I haven't found these rocks, but uh, this is where they should be, in this promontory here. And uh, a closer look, we can see the railway has come through. So if we're lucky, we're still there. But, you know, this is a long time ago now to find uh, good informants about these rocks, and they were, we were lucky to have these conversations recorded when we did back in the 1930s. So somewhere along there are three folks from the Little Watt people. They turn in the stone, perhaps. They're just still waiting for a ride to Spanish. Just around the corner, is another interesting rock. Uh, this one here, which has a name, and on old maps is a white stone, which is where Captain Vancouver camped in 1792 and met with the Squamish people. And uh, later on, other people were camping there because it's a safe place when you have a southerly storm coming up. But you can see the fate of that rock today. It's being buried underneath a log sort. And I bet if we told them what it was, but. I'm just giving a message here about the importance of preserving and recognizing heritage. And uh, these three rocks and this stone are an example of our maritime heritage meeting, meeting caretaking. And maritime history can involve fisheries, and fisheries in this area, the trade between the interior and the coast. We don't have sockeye in the Squamish River system, and you don't have ulican up here. So uh, there were long uh, centuries of trade uh, built up between the coast and the interior, along this, this valley corridor, uh, between Sakai, with Ulican and Sakai as uh, one of the bases. Oops. So, um, this is an artifact Johnny Jones has brought to the attention of the Pembroke Museum. He's found it on Harrison Lake. We have similar weird stuff turned up on House Sound too, like coins from 17th century Europe or old Chinese relics apparently. How did they get there? When did they get there? Maritime history is, history is full of those kinds of little puzzles because it, 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 the travel, it, it can come from anywhere, basically. Uh, over here, there's some theory about a cannonball found in a, in a tree that maybe it was from the skirmishes between the Spaniards and the Indians. Well, there were no skirmishes between the Spaniards and the Indians, but a lot of these mysteries come up and they're part of our maritime history in our region. And another thing that comes by the water are misfortunes, uh, including smallpox. So in 1782, all the way up from Mexico, up the Mississippi Valley waterways, and eventually up into the Pacific Northwest, along the rivers, came the largest and most devastating smallpox epidemic in 1782. And it was followed by another one in the 1860s, the next major one, during the time of the gold rush, came by ship from San Francisco. So this is also a part of our maritime history. A uh, big story for our British Columbia maritime history, the gold rush, of course. And this is a, a side wheeler that's just stepping off over Victoria, unloading a several hundred, it appears, American gold rush uh, or gold seekers in 1860. And of course, a big major chapter of our maritime history, and especially, not least, for our region. So we have, in uh, 1859, reports as far away as Australia. This is Melbourne and Victoria, Australia, uh, news accounts of of gold, Port Douglas, Squamish River, Fraser. Newspapers also traveled by the sea at that time. So this was such an episode for the uh, colonial administration that they had to get busy and sort this out, a strategy. They went back to some, some ideas for a travel route connecting the coast and the interior, at that time Port Langley, 
and into the interior gold country, which we was obviously going to be, and uh, utilize the uh, the knowledge and um, strategy uh, put forward by A.C. Anderson, the little Hudson's Bay Company man, uh, and a trusted uh, servant of um, uh, Governor Douglas. And so this is his original map of this corridor, the first one we have from this period of time. And uh, of course, we have very little at Lake and Port Pembroke up here. And what was Excuse the me, Anderson's yes. name is named after him? That's correct. Yes, and this is named after him. Thank you. It's actually named after his relatives. Oh, and Austin. Seton may also be a relative, some relations to Alexander Caulfield Anderson, yes. if I'm not mistaken. Families intertwined. Right. <laughs> Fort Langley, a big part of the maritime history in the early days of uh, uh, British Columbia. Of course, at that time, there were only two steamships on the coast, both owned by the Hudson's Bay Company. First, the Beaver, and later on, the Otter. And they, they were here for decades, working up and down the coast. And uh, but this, here we are, the uh, First Nations encampments are across the river there, including the Little Walk people. New Westminster, just at the, its beginning, is ready in 1859, and a base for travel to here from a long, long time. And this is drawn by uh, Lieutenant Maine, later Commander Maine, of the British Navy. I'll bet your prices were better than the New West. <laughs> <laughs> now this is the New West waterfront in 1899, but what is interesting about it is we have to imagine what it was like preparing for an exped expedition up to here. And that is what is going on here, because there's new activity in the late 1890s at the head of Harrison Lake, and in this corridor connected to mining. And all of these farmers from all around the Fraser Valley have shown up at the dock Saturday morning in New Westminster, because that's when you're going to load the steamers for Port Douglas in 1899. And of course, that's what they were doing all during the gold rush, these large, uh, all, all this activity at New Westminster that we can only imagine. Interesting photo. The British Navy is a part of the Pemberton Valley maritime history because the British Navy mapped this corridor. Not only how sound, but the entire the lower Fraser all the way up through to Lillooet was mapped by the British Navy. They were, there were altercations with the Americans at that time, border disputes if you like. Um, that uh, meant that there were certain warships available or made available, but when there was downtime, they came up House Sound and did some surveying, or sent Lieutenant Maine off into the bush and looked to see if he could find a better route to the gold fields, which is what they did. They were skilled people, map making, as well as artists, and part of the training. What year is that? This would be 1859 and 1860 that this, the, all of this mapping was done. Uh, both of those years, throughout all of Howe Sound and Burrard Inlet, was mapped by the HMS Plumper, Captain Richards, and off to the right-hand side here is, Le is Lieutenant uh, Richard Charles Maine, after whom Maine Island is named. Uh, Bedford, another officer here, Bedford Bay, a number of place names, HMS Plumper, did a lot of mapping around here, and some of the journals of Captain Richard have been published a couple of years ago, they're very interesting reading. Uh, Captain Richards did not really have an enthusiastic assessment of the corridor from Squamish northward. How Sound, immediately adjoining Burrard Inlet on the north, is an extensive, though probably useless, sheet of water. <laughs> the general depth being very great, well, but there are a few anchorages. Almost entirely hemmed in by rugged and precipitous mountains rising abruptly from the water's edge to elevations 4,000 to 6,000 feet. No available land for the settler. Although a river of considerable size, the Squamish, navigable for boats, falls into its head, it leads by no useful or even practical route into the interior of the country. And it is shortly to be proven wrong by uh, one of his own officers, in fact, who did, uh, at uh, Mr. Douglas's request, take an expedition that's Lieutenant Maine and Captain Richards and Joseph Mackay, and also an ex. Uh, a Hudson's Bay Company man, a Métis also, 
who made both of these uh, parties made mapping expeditions along the route between Howe Sound and Port Pemberton, all to in the service of the strategy to deal with this gold rush influx of thousands from California. The Yankee steamboats on the Fraser River, um, and I mentioned we only had two British. Uh, vessels on the coast at the time the gold rush began in the late 1850s. So all of the steamboats and steamboat technology, captains, everything came from the States. And what was soon uh, revealed is that the Sternweer would be a very practical te vessel design for our waters, for your waters here. We can see why. Uh, you can dock anywhere, don't need a wharf, and very little depth of water needed to operate these paddles. In fact, if you come across a dry patch, th those, those uh, stern wheeler, wheeler uh, will, will take you over it without too much difficulty. Uh, well, no, no opportunity to get hung up on the sides uh, in a narrow passageway as you may with a side wheeler. So the stern wheelers proved to be very uh, effective vessel for these parts and through this valley, if you like. And um, it is, I understand, only in North America where you find stern wheels as part of your uh, the vessel types in your maritime history. In Europe, there are many side wheelers. I've seen them myself in Scotland and different lakes in Europe, but I've never come across a stern wheeler. It's been pointed out by one of the authors specializing in this subject. Of course, they originated in the Mississippi. And uh, but all of these vessels uh, came up from California, and uh, their captains and designs and whatnot. All of those that worked in here in this area were made here. And through this route that now was going to be uh, part of the strategy of the colonial administration was the linking of the Fraser River via the Harrison and through a system of portages that all familiar to us and these lakes. Lillooet Lake and then Anderson and Seton to the Fraser River at Lillooet. And each of these lakes had mm -hmm. their vessel and over the, from the uh, 1860, uh, in late, the late 1860s, we had stern wheels plying these waters. And uh, James Douglas himself has written just really outstanding, very helpful accounts for us today. And um, these uh, outlining the steps that they took to put into place this transportation infrastructure. We propose to use the larger Lillooet Lake. Uh, two stern wheel steamers intended to ply on Lakes Anderson and Seton are nearly complete, completed by an association of settlers who at much labor and expense packed the engines and boilers from Douglas over the Harrison Road. To give an idea of the difficulty of the undertaking, I may mention that the boilers being too heavy to carry on mules were rolled over the trail as far as the 28-mile house in five sections. So uh, these are very interesting accounts from the top man, uh, James Douglas. So we have Port Douglas here. And... Uh, um, the town site here, just a little bit upstream. And some recent work has been done by the provincial government in assessing potential heritage assets, projects to undertake, and really there's so much work to be done here uh, at Port Douglas, Port Pemberton, if you like. All, all through this, this district, there is uh, work to be done to assess heritage assets. Um, and here we have Port Douglas again. Uh, 1865, a gold rush photographer, uh, uh, Carlo Gentile, an Italian Canadian, and a recent book has compiled his photographs, which should be very interesting. It was interesting. And the gold rush is well documented in photography. However, the Douglas route here through Port Pemberton, unfortunately, is not compared to the other route. You're just the photographers are coming along 1864, 1865. By that time. This is the less favored route for the gold seekers heading up into the interior. Here's 29 mile uh, house there at the uh, bottom end of the lake where a steamer 
would take you to Fort Pemberton. And here we have the Prince of Wales steamer. This would be about 1865. An earlier one was the Marcel that plied the waters of Lake Lillooet. And uh, it's just one of the only photos we have of that vessel. And here it is here. You can see that the flag is it's sort of sit, sitting backwards there, but to read it, it's Prince of Wales. It's often mistaken as the Lady of the Lake. Uh, we are very poor in our resources of photos of these vessels. This is one of the only depictions we have of the steam, uh, steam leaders uh, that fly these uh, network of lakes here. And so this is very important to Pemberton maritime history. This everything around the Prince of Wales. There's, a, there's some good stories around this vessel. And it's the, uh, the anchor of your maritime history, I would suggest. Um, and another thing unique to Pemberton maritime history, well, all maritime history has seasickness, boiler explosions, shipwrecks. I don't find too, many of, too much of that in our local maritime history here. But in Pemberton, death by mosquitoes. A melancholy, a melancholy accident occurred a few evenings ago on the Prince of Wales steamer on Lillooet Lake. The mosquitoes being very thick, the engineer filled the pan with lighted charcoal, got down the forward hatchway, which he closed, and lay down to sleep. He was found dead, having been smothered by the charcoal fumes. And here we are at Port Pemberton. Um, but that is part of the... Uh, uh, if you like, the value of the Prince of Wales story is that uh, we have with that the remains. Now here's the site as I best can estimate, just at the side of the road here where the pilings are. But as Nikki and others have explained to me, there's been much work done to the lakes, affecting the level of the lakes in that, in that, in that vicinity. But here we are in the old Pemberton Landing, uh, more or less in that position, as I, I would estimate. And looking to the south, and you can see the works that were done. I take it back in the 1950s to lower the level of the lake. So we need to take this into account when we're looking for these sites. Now, um, this is really the administration uh, getting this network and this transportation infrastructure underway with uh, offering uh, monies for people who invest will invest in steam uh, steam wheelers or road road uh, undertakings and uh, putting out tenders uh, also on the Fort Fort Yale wagon road the competing route but uh, this is to be in 1860 it should be there 1859 1860 all of this work is underway offering incentives for people to come up here and build steamboats. Uh, Mr. Moody, and this is a, quite a sophisticated modern tender notice for road construction through this valley in 1860. And uh, the Marcel reference here to the first steamer that was at, on Lake Lillooet. And concern that the people the government is giving incentives to are setting up monopolies Prices exorbitant for the travelers. And Mr. Douglas again, giving us an update. And that, for example, on Lesser Lillooet Lake, uh, Tenast Lake, uh, you're still needing to be using a rowboat because there needs to be some further infrastructure improvements to facilitate uh, steep uh, stern wheeler passage. And these accounts are extremely interesting. Um, he's reporting, of course, to the colonial administration in London, and uh, they're really marvelously written, full of detail, and entertaining as well. Uh, the Marcel he refers to here, and Port Pemberton describes the farming district of Port Pemberton, the first settler that he uh, acknowledges as being a Mr. Jones, and we arrived at Port Anderson just in time to participate in the trial trip of the Lady of the Lake steamer, and this would be in fall of 1860. And uh, here, still in the 1860, steamboat arrangements on Seaton and Anderson Lakes are anything but satisfactory. But they are improving. <laughs> and uh, we have here an account 
of a traveler, 1862, showing how you get from Victoria to the gold fields in full detail, and this kind of information is distributed around the world. Letter from Lillooet, a Mr. Chapman of the steamer Lady of the Lake on Anderson Lake is running a stage from here to Clinton. Many of these entrepreneurs were involved also in hotel accommodations as well as steamers and packing and, and uh, wagon road work and set up very nice businesses for themselves and I'm sure a number of them did very well. Now, so well that some of them were called pirates. And, um, the, but however, we're going to turn to another kind of description that, um, uh, of uh, some of the things going along on the route. Of course, on some of these routes before there were steamers or when the steamers were so expensive, there was still a lot of canoe traffic. And uh, with the Little Walk people offering their services. And I'm just going to quote here from uh, historian Daniel Marshall who's written extensively about the gold rush, and this is from a few years ago. Prior to the establishment of Crown-granted contracts for companies to engage in developing water transportation, Native peoples often carried miners across the lakes, these lakes, in exchange for goods such as food, blankets, or shirts. Charles Gardner, a young gold seeker from Prince Edward Island, recalled the ancient times both he and his party had in one such crossing. An Anderson Lake company were permitted to pitch their tents after a great many military evolutions by native peoples armed with muskets, knives, bows, and arrows, their faces painted, and at Seaton Portage, Gardner's parties hired natives to pack across the short land bridge before setting out across the lake in, in a canoe. During the crossing, the guides apparently made an unprecedented departure from their intended course, beaching the canoe at an Indian village. One of about 100, about 50 assembled natives quickly snatched the gold seeker's most prized possession, the camp kettle. <laughs> I jumped out and gave chase, exclaimed Gardner, but only a short distance until two guns were cocked and leveled at my head. In a few moments, though, the old chief came down with a kettle in his hand, which he had to, we had to buy back. <laughs> my partner, taking the handkerchief from his neck, gave it to the old chief, who gave it, in, who gave it then in our presence to the villain who took the kettle. <laughs> now, it seems to me that this story belongs in the same file as the, the Little Wet Chief's declaration. This isn't pirates. It belongs in that other file. But um, we do have other instances of piracy, which we'll come to. But the most, most prominent one were these people, these entrepreneurs, who set up monopolies along this route here. So here we have Anderson Lake and Port Anderson. The maps, of course, as I mentioned earlier, from the British Navy. Seton Lake, with the lone steamer here, which will probably be the Seton. And the Enterprise is the first stern wheeler on the upper Fraser, that is from Soda Creek up to Quinnell. However, how did they get it up there? They packed it through here. The boilers and the engines for the Enterprise were packed through Port Pembroke part of your maritime history. And here we have here, the, the Enterprise is wrecked on a lake near Fort St. James, the Trondor Lake. And uh, these artifacts are part of your maritime history. They were packed through Pembroke in about 1862. Now this is quite interesting. We, we have, as the, in the early 1860s, a competition between the two routes, the Yale route the wagon road group up the Fraser Canyon, and this one. And these, and we'll explore in a little bit uh, 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 more readable uh, uh, fashion in, in a second here, but the left-hand side is all of the advertisements for the Port Douglas, Port Pemberton route. The other one is for the Yale route in 1863. See what they have to say about each other. <coughs> Hurrah for caribou! Douglas and Lillooet route is by far the shortest and the best for both men and animals to the caribou mines. No, no, no. Every person should know that the shortest, best, and cheapest route to the caribou mines is the Yale and Lytton route. And uh, the distances, they argue about that. Compare the above and so on. Um, remember that Lillooet is 15 miles above Lytton. And 
our new and splendid steamer, the Prince of Wales, on Lake Lillooet, 100 tons burden, will make two trips per day. You won't get stuck on our route. Capable of taking the heaviest wagons or even an entire mule train on Lake Lillooet. On Seton Lake, we just completed another steamer, the Prince Alfred. I think it was named to, to something else, uh, uh, but that one doesn't come up again. On the other side, remember that on this route there are no portages for goods or uh, animals and um, required. And $20 per ton less, so there's intense competition between these two routes here. New and splendid steamer, the Reliance, connects with the Victoria steamer, the Enterprise, at Sword Creek. Let's go back to here, it says here, slam the Douglas, the Douglas Lillard route. <laughs> and over here, avoid the Lytton route. <laughs> Shippers are assured. <laughs> you get the idea. And uh, you can see that the greater length and number of businesses on this route in 1863, that was to change, but it was by far the more popular. Elegant route to the Caribou. Yeah. <laughs> so what changed? Well, the Caribou Wagon Road was under construction in 1862. And in 1863, the Alexandra Bridge. This really spelled the end of the heyday for the Douglas, Port Pemberton, and Anderson and Seton Lakes route. And we can see here the Caribou Road was finished end of July 1863. Prior to this, 90% of all the traffic went via Lillooet, Port Douglas route. The steamers of the Lillooet, Anderson, and Seton Lakes were dismantled. Machinery was shipped out, one outfit going to Lytton. Flour mill was started in 1870 by Charles Chapman, a local entrepreneur here, and uh, probably using some engine parts from one or another steamer. And we're still busy though with mining activity here. Bridge River Mines, from Scotty at Port Pemberton, I learned that a Chinaman has arrived at Bridge River is taking out $1,200 in gold. You can draw your own conclusions. All of these ads, without exception, are for the Yale Lytton so in 1866, we're very much in decline along this room as regards traffic. And over here, a steam engine is for sale. A tubular boiler, two horizontal cylinders, and so on, uh, was par a part of the vessel, the Seton, on Seton Lake, now decommissioned by 1869. We do have steamers on Seton Lake uh, continuing activity long afterwards local traffic, um, mining, and later railway related, of course. Uh, but these are, are uh, the last of the steamer boats on the Seton Lake. This is a very noted uh, BC surveyor, Swanell, his wife Ada, in the background of the photo. And they were on a Seton Lake steamer in 1910 as they passed through here. Frank Swanell has a number of wonderful photographs of this area, and of course, Northern British Columbia as well. Uh, preserved in the BC archives. Oops. Now, this is from a previous visit to the Pembroke Museum. You do, of course, have artifacts, and as you've mentioned, not only sites, but artifacts connected to the Prince of Wales. I don't know where this is now uh, in your premises here. A brick from the firebox of the Prince of Wales is here in the museum. Spikes from the Prince of Wales. Sliver of wood from the hull of the Prince of Wales. <laughs> And here is the 1957, if I'm not mistaken, Lions Club organized expedition to recover the remains of the Prince of Wales. And with your better local uh, geography, you'll be able to uh, help me out on where this uh, is, is located, on the Birkenhead, as I, as I understand. A 1957 photos of Evil 3. And here's an aerial photo from the museum's collections. And if I'm not mistaken, this is the site of the hall, perhaps up here? Not sure. But this is an aerial photo of the location of where it, 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 it ended up. We have uh, the Port Pemberton map 
uh, overlaid against this in I the see. exhibit next door. Oh, good. And basically, most of that photograph was water in 1858. So the it's the sediment coming down the rivers that has filled in the what was lakefront. So the effort to recover the remains was was quite close in in time to the to the uh, project to lower the level of the lake. Uh, it's that started in forty seven, so it would have been done by fifty seven. I see. Yeah. But it did increase water flow down the Birkenhead, yes. which might have scoured uh, the area where the boat was mm -hmm. at the time. I think I've got a couple more photos of the of the recovery efforts there. This is a 1970 color photo on the bottom. And uh, you have uh, the shaft of the, I assume the main propeller shaft of the Prince of Wales, just by the fence on the side here. Now, we come into a new chapter of the Pemberton Area Maritime History, and that is the CPR. And one of the interesting things that uh, is being put forward by writers such as Daniel uh, Marshall, this Gold Rush historian, is the link between the Gold Rush and the CPR project. And I'll just read a few passages from some of his observations that the discovery of the gold on the Fraser made the British and Canadian governments alike more aware of the importance of preserving the route across the prairies to the link with the Pacific Slope. A land-based northwest passage Another effect of the Fraser River discoveries is their determination of the route for the Great Pacific Railroad. The Fraser River discoveries have hastened the results they have not diverted. Practical notions of a transcontinental uh, railway began to take active shape. These are quotes and observations by historian Daniel Marshall. He's not alone, however. This uh, is the route, one of the routes surveyed by the, for the Canadian Pacific Railway was through Pemberton and Squamish to Howe Sound. And really, in the end, the main reason why the other route, the present route of the CPR was selected is because Burrard in it is such a superb natural harbor. And few of the other routes, or none of them, could really compete with that basic essential fact of Burrard in it as a superb terminus uh, location. However, it did come through here, the surveyors, and this is quite important. Walter Moberly, way back during the gold rush, also had these ideas already then uh, of a northwest passage by rail, transcontinental railway. He was here and uh, up into the Chequemus Valley, surveying, thinking about a transcontinental railway route, and uh, wrote about it and uh, continued with this uh, vision to the end of his days. So, uh, not a new observation that the gold rush and the people then, uh, or the circumstances, were pointing the way forward to the CPR. At Squamish, when British Columbia joined Confederation, it was already clear that there was, this could be a strategic harbor, and when the negotiations with the Squamish chiefs took place for reserves in 1876, uh, the chiefs acknowledged that the lower half of Squamish Island should and could be preserved as a future port location. And so it was. Everything south of Pemberton Avenue in downtown Squamish was never part of a reserve because already at Confederation in 1871, it was identified as potentially a strategic place, a future port for, not least, Pemberton. And uh, in the interior, here we have here, which is what is taking place. Now, another aspect of the, uh, we're looking here at the Howe Sound route, or body of water, and its relationship to Pemberton maritime history. Mr. Mashier was first settler in uh, the Lower Squamish, and uh, you have all sorts of ter difficult terrain in the valley here, so do we, lots of sloughs. We filled them all in by now, just about, but at the time when Mr. Mashier was there and the Pemberton uh, travelers were coming down, they were stuck. Mr. Mashiner had the post office in store. He was the local Anglican minister. He also ran a boat across the channel, this channel, where the Pentecostal church is now before the bridge was built. The people walked down from Pemberton and wanted to come into Squamish to take the boat to the city. They used to, they used to shoot a rifle three times. Then Mr. Mashiner would take his time and walk up, take his boat over, and bring them back. Part of the maritime history 
of February. And here we are, the original landing at Squamish, at uh, foot of Winnipeg Street. Now, this is the construction of that bridge that uh, resolved this problem uh, for Pembroke travelers coming to Tidewater. Uh, another early settler, Mr. Galbraith, made a decision that the route of the Harrison through Port Douglas to Pemberton and beyond was not the one that had a future. Instead, it would be the Squamish route. And relocated from Harrison Mills, where he had a hotel and trading post, to Squamish in 18, or 1902. His, here he is with his wife, and he raised a family. And uh, one of his daughters married uh, Frank Buckley, who was well connected here in Pemberton. He spent many years working here. Um, but at any rate, uh, one of, a lot of his trade was with the Little Watt people. And they were on their way down south to work in hop farms and so on. And increasingly, they weren't taking Harrison Route. They were coming down the Squamish Route. This is the hotel he built, a uh, Galbraith Squamish Hotel. And it was the base at the southern end for the Pemberton Trail. And in fact, the Elliott brothers, who were packers on the Pemberton Trail, ran this hotel for quite a long time. And uh, it had a lot of difficulty keeping a liquor license with the authorities in Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the Galbraith uh, Squamish Hotel right here at the uh, end of the long trestle, taking it out to where steamers could land on our second landing, Squamish landing, an improvement over the earlier master landing, but heavily used by Pemberton Valley folks. Newport, another chapter, the next installment of what was to be the Pacific outlet for this area, and uh, that is the railway. And Newport, the vision for Newport was very much uh, inspired by investors seeing the future of the Panama Canal, what it could offer for trade back to the Atlantic. And timber and other resources, sell them back to the old country, ship them through the Panama Canal. British Columbia is so well situated. In fact, the railway from Squamish or the south, the south coast here up into the interior already sketched in in the visions of how can we take advantage of the Panama Canal. The Panama Canal is part of the Pemberton Maritime History. And we can see the Western Canada vision for the Newport in investors and later the Pacific Great Eastern investors. Uh, with a network of rail going all the way up to Fort Churchill on Hudson's Bay. <laughs> that House Sound would be the natural outlet, and it is uh, in many respects uh, by the way the, how the flow, crow flies uh, as an outlet to the Pacific. And Newport is on the map, so is Pemberton. And the resources are all outlined agricultural resources, mining resources, and now will be shipped out through House Sound. And Newport will be the funnel. Inevitable, absolutely inevitable. And a city of 50,000 is going to spring up here. And all kinds of investments here as well. Uh, and an interesting thing that they observe is, to come back to our local lakes here, uh, that we, we could not see the original house sound of northern investors, the necessity of expending a couple of million dollars to construct some 40 miles of difficult roadway railway to the head of house sound, um, that is, we, we will enable this to be a revenue producing railway and when we get up to this area we have Anderson Lake and Seton Lake and from that point water transportation is available. So the original railway investors were thinking water transportation still through this area. That's being much more practical. And so when the railway was built of course new water marine vessels uh, investments made on Anderson and Seton Lakes. But I'll bet a lot of equipment came up via Lillooet Lake as well for the railway construction. Did not surprise me. Uh, of course, by now, 1917, Pemberton farmers can ship through Port Squanch. A car of potatoes from Pemberton Meadows arrived consigned to Rainsford and Company. The spuds uh, and the potato market is strong. It will sell for $80 a ton loading the first cars that will hit the dock at Squamish. And agricultural exports from the caribou eventually through livestock trains 
uh, being, this is 1946 at Squamish. And potatoes shipped to Vancouver, not only by train, but by barge, let's keep in mind. So barge, uh, all of the Pemberton produce was barge to Vancouver, part of the maritime history. A strong demand for cedar poles for telegraph, telephone, and power line purposes is creating considerable traffic along the line. 1916. And the market was California. So a lot of pole cutters here in this area shipping out cedar via the lake railway to barging cargo at Squamish and on to California. Special vessels were built, part of the maritime history. And you can see here poles being loaded in this area back in the 19, oh, late teens, early 20s. And also the river being used for cottonwood, sending cottonwood down to mills around New Westminster. And so during the 1920s, there was quite an enterprise going on. Gauthier, the name of the entrepreneur, working with Lilwak people, contractors, and uh, uh, sending logs down the Lilwak River, cottonwood, at this time, uh, also part of your maritime history. Lower Lillowit takes outlet into Harrison. Cottonwood Drive from Pemberton. And, of course, other forms of log drive by the Tribune Company and predecessors, Brooks Scanlon, on the Lower Little River. And lots of use and uh, engagement with uh, or of uh, uh, Little Watt, uh, community folks. And unique in the maritime history of this region, putting sails on a log raft on the lake. <laughs> I've never heard that anywhere else in the world. <laughs> and bullion, of course, during the gold rush time, it went down to San Francisco, to the San Francisco Mint. Down Lake Lillooet, New Westminster, onto ships down to San Francisco. In the 1930s, another great gold mining era for British Columbia gold went through Squamish. In the late 30s, Squamish was the busiest gold bullion harbor in the world. And that includes from the Bridge River country, as well as the Caribou, and local mines uh, all over the place, Cashew and, and around these parts as well. So that's a gold carrier, this time bound for Tacoma, or the, the smelter. The log trains. Uh, and this is the Fleetwood Company that developed this log dump on the Squamish River. Of course, logs coming from here. And uh, over time, uh, many local companies, the railway dump at Squamish now phased out, but very busy with Pemberton loggers loading trains down to the docks at Squamish. And truckers as well. This was the, called the community log dump at the foot of Winnipeg Street. Very busy with uh, logging activity, uh, contractors and operators from this area. And today, I would call this Port Pemberton. Virtually all of the activity in this operation at Squamish Harbor is Pemberton uh, uh, forestry operators. And uh, uh, we're coming to a couple of final chapters in uh, this framework, this brief overview of maritime history of Pemberton. This one concerns piracy. Tapella was a city and is discussed as such in the manual on BC ghost towns. The city of Tupela was uh, sprang up in the late 1890s and went for about 10, 15 years based on a mine up in the Fire Creek Valley. And uh, there's a wharf there and lots of new steamer activity. And here we don't have any pictures of the vessel, the city of Tupela, a steamer. But uh, we do have refer this reference to uh, the owner wanting to rename it with a Canadian name. It was an American vessel and wanted to call it the city of Tupela. And uh, uh, the captain was Captain Alex McLean. Jack London Seawolf is the, the main character is based on your local sea cap or, or tugboat captain, Jack McLean or sorry, Alex McLean of the city of Tepel. And he was uh, probably in the late 40s and 50s uh, at the end of his career as a seaman, but he had his, most of his career was as a sealer. And it is uh, um, 
according to Jack London himself, in discussing his novel and its background, Maclean had an exciting record of adventure, and upon his deeds, I based my Sea Wolf character. Of course, much of the Sea Wolf is imaginary development, but the basis is Alexander Maclean of the city of Tepelic. According to West Coast journalist uh, Noel Robinson some years ago, there's no doubt that Alexander McLean became known from Alaska to San Francisco as the Sea Wolf, was a born outlaw, and there are more stories told of his hair-raising adventures, including 70 alleged murders. <laughs> and brushes with officers of the law up and down the Pacific Coast that are told about any other man who has made his home if the word home can be used in connection with a man who was hardly ever home, well, in the end, his home was here, not so far away. <laughs> there have been many editions of this uh, best, or one of the uh, best loved novels of uh, Jack London, and this is the original character, uh, Captain Larson Wonders About Things. Larson's fictional name in the novel. I evolved his face from the marvelous description of it. Here's to you, Jack. <laughs> Alex McLean. And so here we are, the sea wolf, the story of this, this notorious cedar pirate, uh, outlaw, and a number of movies have been made, made about 12 movies have been made about this character based on Alex McLean, skipper, City of Tapella on Lake Lulu. <laughs> so, in uh, the late 60s and early 70s, you had a good sized sawmill here in the Pemberton Valley, Evans Products. Evans Products is part of the Seaboard group of companies exporting uh, wood around the world. Uh, their market was mostly California. And the ship it traveled on was called the Lake Lillooet. And uh, the company that owned the Lake Lillooet, the Western Canada Steamship Company, contracting to Seaboard and Evans Products. And uh, I'm not going to get away with this and describing this as being on Lake Lillooet. But it is, I suggest, part of the maritime history of the Pemberton area, this vessel, and its name, and its purpose, to transship forest products from the Evans Products Mill, among others, to California. And... Uh, we have here, it had another, ladder, laterally it was owned by a Greek uh, shipping company and had its name changed again here, but here it's loading lumber from, well, may as well be Evans Products Mill of Pemberton and bound for California. So, does Pemberton have a maritime history? And I'm not going to find my way back. <laughs> I would suggest it does, and uh, it's just it's just a uh, a compilation of, of images. But I suggest it it really can be said to be based around the Cedar Dugout Canoe, the Prince of Wales, <laughs> and um, well the the numerous ties to changes in transportation corridors and their use, uh, Pacific, Fraser River, Howe Sound. Uh, the lakes through here, and I suggest we're just scratching the surface. And let's do justice to this route versus the competition over there in the Fraser Canyon. <laughs> <laughs>